so to speak, in the direction that I feel led of the Lord for us to, to reach for. I believe 2016 is going to be a great year. It's already started out as a great year, and, uh, and I'm thankful for his goodness. Why don't you pray with me right now? We need the help of the Lord. Would you lift up your voice with me? Pray for me as a preacher. Pray for your heart as a hearer of the word. Lord, we are open today. We're coming to you honestly at this point of this service. We really need to hear what your spirit is going to say to us, God. Lord, this Sunday has been in your mind for a long time. And you have a direct word for New Life Church. You have a direct word for every member and every guest that is here. And so, Lord, I ask that you would let the anointing of a preacher rest upon me right now. I pray that you will use the words that are preached. I humbly ask that all of our hearts will just be open to receive. And we will do more than hear, but we will be doers of the word as well. I thank you. I give you praise and glory. And we commit all of this into your hands in the name of Jesus Christ. And everyone, would you say amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. And thank you for your prayer. Why is the sky blue? When our dog dies, will she go to heaven? When... You must not know my dog. <laughs> when was God born? When I grow up, Daddy, will I have wrinkles like you? Mom, do mosquitoes really die once they bite you? His name was Ralph B. Smith. He is a prolific writer, and he once made an observation that children ask roughly 125 questions per day. And yet adults typically ask six questions a day. So somewhere between childhood and adulthood, we lose 119 questions per day. There is inside and embedded in every child an innate curiosity about life that I believe is instilled in them at birth by the one who longs to be discovered. The more questions children ask, the more they discover about the world around them and the more that they discover about the one who made them. You see, children possess a wonderful desire to go somewhere, to learn something new, to discover something previously unknown. And yet, without trying to profile the generations, as adults, it is easy to settle. It is easy to grow accustomed to life. It is easy, if we're not careful as adults, to learn to just simply repeat behavior, or worse yet, even stagnate in life. It is very easy as an adult to settle, to get used to life. This is why I often believe and declare with my mouth that youth and children's ministry at a local church and even larger than that on national settings is some of the most important ministries to which a church can place their hand. Why? Because in those young people, in those children, in those young adults, values are still being formed. Career paths have not been cemented yet. And it is so important that in an age of discovery, in an age of natural exploration in a young person's life, that we foster that habit, 
that we encourage that habit because I do not believe for a moment that it is God's plan and God's intent for any of us ever to feel like we've arrived and we've got everything figured out. I have served the Lord for years now, but there is a longing in my spirit this morning to know the Lord more than I've ever known Him before. I haven't figured Him out yet. I haven't got Him reduced down to a formula. I don't think He wants us to do that. I think He desires for us to grow and to go and to learn and to discover something previously unknown. And so in the late summer and early fall of 2015, I was praying and specifically asking the Lord for a little jump start on 2016. I know that there is nothing inherently magical about the turning of a calendar. And yet I felt compelled in my spirit, Lord, what is it that you want this church, this one that you have so blessed me to have the privilege to serve God among these wonderful people in Cabot? What are you saying to us as a church? What are you wanting to declare among your people? What kind of values, what kind of purpose are you wanting to uh, help us to understand in 2016? And the call of the Spirit to me, and I believe in a larger sense the call of the Holy Ghost to New Life Church is clear in 2016, and that is this, we must learn And we must be obedient to follow Jesus in every area of our life. I am praying that in 2016 we will, all of us, individually and collectively, put roots down spiritually that will weather any storm that will come. We will absolutely put our shoulder to the wheel, so to speak, and say, Lord, whatever comes, I'm going to follow you. Whatever you say, I'm going to follow that. Wherever you direct, I'm going after that. I am in hot pursuit of you. I want to know you greater than I've ever known you before. I want to be more obedient to you than I've ever been obedient before. I want to follow you. I am prayerful that that will be the reverberating heartbeat of every person in this house. Now please let me preach this morning like I feel it. I'm praying that that will be the heartbeat of every new convert at New Life Church. I'm praying that every new believer recently baptized in the name of Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, will have such a desire to discover more about Jesus than they have ever discovered before. But I am also praying for every seasoned believer. And every person who has wonderfully occupied a place in an apostolic church for years to let something birth inside of us that says, I haven't come this way before. I haven't discovered everything that I need to know about the Lord. I want to follow Him this year. And so the call, I believe, from the Lord is clear. Number one, to learn what it means, what it truly means to be a Christ follower. The big churchy word for it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And number two, once I find out what that is, then to follow that. To go, to do, to be. To be what God is calling me to be this year. To go where He says to go. And to become all that He has in store for us. There is nothing quite as exhilarating as following Jesus Christ. Because we do not know where that path will lead us. How many of you have followed the Lord long enough to know that sometimes His will takes us down a path that we were not planning to go on? 
How many of you ever known that, that his, his, his call, his following, following after him, sometimes lets us meet people we never thought we would meet? Can I get a witness in the house? Ready? I'm going to go right down here in our business today. How many of you have found that when you learn to follow Jesus, it will put desires inside of us that we never had before, but when we follow him, we say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. It's exhilarating. It's exciting. It's an adventure. You never know what God is up to. How many of you here reserve the right for God to blow your mind? In fact, this is the reason that God gave us the five-fold ministry in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. Let me read it in your hearing. He himself, Ephesians chapter 4, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man. How long am I going to follow Jesus until I'm a perfect man? Turn to someone and say, perfect person. Look at someone right now and ask them, are you a perfect person? <laughs> Your spouse will answer that for you real quick. How long are we going to follow after Jesus? How long am I going to read his word? How long am I going to be responsive to his spirit calling in my life? I'm going to stay at it until I'm a perfect man. That word per perfect in the scripture doesn't refer simply to perfection or without fault. It refers to a complete man. And I'm here to confess to you on Sunday morning, I'm not there yet. I haven't arrived yet. I'm still on the path. I'm still on the road. Why? Because I want to follow him to perfection. I want to follow him to completion, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, hear me now, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Look at someone around you and say, you got to grow up. By the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. It is the will of God in 2016 for us to grow up in Christ. <laughs> to not be spiritual babies, not be spiritual infants, but to grow. And the, the pace with which we grow will totally be determined by our availability to the Lord. So my pace will be different than your pace, and it's supposed to be like that. And your pace will be different than the pace of someone next to you. But the key is, are we growing? And am I following him? As a hallmark verse that will govern many things that we will do this year. I direct you to Mark chapter 8 and verse 34. Mark chapter 8 and verse 34. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I want you to notice the very first part of Mark chapter 8 and verse 34. Before any disciples walk dusty trails in Galilee, before any disciples open up blind eyes by the power of Jesus, before any disciples break bread and fish and feed 5,000 in one setting and 4,000 in another, not counting women and children. Before any disciples do any monumental ministry, the Bible says that Jesus first called people to himself. Because the call to discipleship always begins 
with knowing God, knowing him, finding out about him, determining according to his word, who is this one that is calling me closer to him? We, as a church and as individuals today, are called by God to know him better than we've ever known him before. It is why the great apostle Paul, the author of 14 books of the New Testament, a learned man, an intelligent man, a very accomplished man, a man who said of himself, I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was well learned. He was seminary trained. He had a lot of stuff going for him. But that man, that learned intelligent man said, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For His sake I have suffered the loss of all things and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share His sufferings becoming like Him in His death. I don't know what that does to you, but when I consider a man who had degrees pasted on the wall and from a world's perspective had no reason to accomplish anything more, who states boldly and declaratively, all of these accomplishments are like the trash heap in the back of my house. When I consider knowing him, when I consider what it means to know Him, I have made up in my mind in 2016, I want to know Jesus like I have never known Him. I want to discover His Word and His grace and His mercy in ways I have never known Him before. Before people ever walk in the demonstration of discipleship, they first are called to Jesus. When he had called the people to himself. And so throughout 2016, we will proactively and with intention plan events, teaching and preaching about knowing him. We follow him when we first know him. Mark chapter number 3 and verse 13 and he, Jesus, went up on the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted, and they came to him. Then he appointed twelve that they might, watch this, be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses, and to cast out demons. Please note the, the specific wording of verse 13. Jesus went up on a mountain. Everybody say up on a mountain. And he called to him those who he himself wanted. And they came to him. A lot of times it's easy, and I'm very guilty of this, to use verbiage like Jesus came to us. Jesus visited us. Jesus came down in the house today and blessed us. But do you know the call to discipleship is not for Jesus to come to us, but for us to come to Jesus. And just as sure in Mark 3 as he went up on a mountain and called people up to him, his call to follow him and his call to know him is always a call Upward. His call to follow him is never a call 
down. This is why I believe the most joyous people in the world are those who are responding to the upward call of Jesus Christ. He calls us up in our commitment. He calls us up in our sacrifice. He calls us up in our giving. He calls us up in every area of commitment. I'm talking about following him. And that always has as a prerequisite knowing him. Everybody say knowing him. It is in the 8th chapter of Mark in that 34th verse that I found the second part of our focus for 2016. And that is after Jesus has called the people to himself, he makes this emphatic statement. Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Now, I am quite certain that in the next seven or eight minutes in this room, we will not run aisles and jump chairs. Why? Because a preacher can't preach about denying oneself and people just eat it up. Why? Because most of the time, the biggest enemy to me following Jesus is me. This is why Jesus says, if any man will come after me, if anybody's going to follow me, he must first deny himself. That word deny literally means to forget about oneself. To lose sight of oneself and one's interests. So please hear me, New Life Church. The call to follow Jesus means that to do that correctly and to do that adequately, I must lose sight of myself. I must make sure that the leading power in my life is not Tim Gaddy. But there's a higher purpose. And there's a higher calling. This is why God calls us to pray. Why? Because truthfully, hear me, I've never met anybody that ever said to me, boy, I just had three or four convenient hours to pray today. I've never met anybody that practiced and followed a regiment of fasting with prayer that said to me, I love to go without food. I enjoy not eating food. I enjoy eating food. I don't know about you, but I practice that just about every day. I'm in the habit of that. I plan on doing a little bit of that here in just a little while. But please hear me. When it comes to following Jesus, Jesus said, if someone's going to follow me, the first order of business is they have to know me. they got to come to me. The second thing is they must deny themselves. Everybody, I know this is painful, but take your pointer finger and just point it at yourself and say, self, you can't rule the day. Come on, I wish someone would get a preacher gumption in you right now. Preach to yourself. Say, self, you're not in charge. You're not in charge of 2016. You're not in charge of my agenda. You're not in charge of my passions. You're not in charge of my time. Because I'm not following you, Tim. I'm following Jesus Christ. And so with God's help, I'm going to lose sight of my interests. I'm going to lose sight of myself even when it's not convenient. It's amazing to me how our culture has changed even in the last 30 or 40 years. Recent statistics show us that the median number of years that a U.S. worker 
has been in his or her current job is 4.4 years. This is down very sharply since the 1970s. The average U.S. worker will have 10 to 12 jobs in any lifetime. This decline in the average job tenure in our country is bigger than any economic cycle. It's bigger than any particular industry. It's bigger than differences in educational levels, and it is bigger than differences in agenda. And while I am not here to make a moral statement about switching jobs, that happens, and that is the will of God at times. I think maybe it's indicative, the decline in the number of years that people stay at something so noteworthy as a career or a job is indicative of our culture. There is an increasing desire to try something and then when it gets tough to get out of it. But I am finding the longer I live for the Lord, when I live for Him and everything's going great, that's awesome. But when things get tough and when I walk through the valley, that's not the time to grow cold. That is not the time to throw up the white flag. That is not the time when I get sideways with my brother or my sister in church. That's not the time to switch churches. That's not the time to bail on the Lord and say, Lord, it must not be right for me to serve you. That's the time to dig your heels in and square my shoulders back and say, I'm going to stay at it. Because I've found that sometimes on the other side of the valley, there is a blessing that he teaches me if I just stay at it and deny myself. I wish I could get some of y'all off of dead center this morning. I'd just take a wave of your hand this morning. Come on, somebody. It's not about us. Oh, God. Lord, right now, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will break through selfishness and break through me-itis and break through anything that elevates me higher than you. Let me deny myself. And take up my cross. Oh, most of the time I like to relegate cross-bearing to Jesus. Say, Lord, you did that. Isn't that good enough? And yet the call of Jesus to discipleship involves denying, losing sight of myself and taking up my cross. Luke 14 and 27, Jesus said, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Less of me and more of Jesus is always the recipe for discipleship. And this requires walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit. There is a clarion call this morning for New Life Church to know God and to walk in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit presupposes that I've already denied myself. And I have decided that my walk and my day and my agenda will not be guided by Tim anymore. But I will throw the sail up in the air. And I will ask the Lord often, Lord, what is your Spirit saying today? Not what is my flesh saying today. But what is your spirit saying today? Lead me, Holy Spirit. Lead us, Holy Ghost. Lead us. Help us to walk in the Spirit. I have a strong desire today. I have a very strong desire for every person under the sound of my voice to absolutely drive hell crazy. I want every man and every woman, when hell looks at us, to start quaking in their boots. 
And let me tell you when hell doesn't quake in the brutes is when I respond in the flesh. <laughs> oh, pastor loves us, but he's gone to meddling right now. It's when I start responding in my flesh. I start popping off at the mouth. I start adopting practices and I just qualify it by saying, that's just me. That's just me. Just put up with it. That's just me. Honey, that's the problem. When I'm a follower of Jesus, it can't be just about me. But I want to drive hell crazy. And I want to be a spiritual man. Listen to me. I want to be a spiritual man that wakes up in the morning saying, Lord, I'm denying myself today. And I'm asking, Spirit of God, what do you want me to be involved in? Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to talk to? Let me ask you a question real quick. This is not a trick question. How many of you know Jesus drove the devil crazy? How many of you know Jesus gave the devil a bad day over and over and over again? What would happen in Cabot if the same spirit that dwelt in Christ was the predominant powerful force that worked in our lives? You talk about putting hell on edge. Hell doesn't want people walking in the spirit. Hell wants us responding in the flesh. Hell wants us to be on the throne and Jesus sitting over in the corner. But I've decided in 2016, I'm going to walk in the spirit. With God's help, I'm going to walk in the spirit. There's no telling. Let me just speak it like I feel it. There's no telling what can happen in this church in one year's time if people choose to walk in the spirit. There are neighborhoods that can be one to the Lord. There are culture groups that are not yet sitting in this sanctuary that can come to the Lord. There are people with addictions that can be set free when people say I'm walking in the spirit I'm being led by the spirit I'll follow him everybody say walk in the spirit come on just testify to someone around you say we need to walk in the spirit why Paul said walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh if we have a problem with temptation, start walking in the Spirit. Verse 25 of Galatians 5, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. I love what Paul means when he says that. He said, this life that you live was birthed in the Holy Ghost. So live in the Holy Ghost. How many of you know that God gave us the Holy Spirit to do more than jabber in tongues? Woo. Oh, Pastor, I remember that morning. I remember that night when woo, the Holy Ghost came on me and I started speaking in tongues. Woo, that was awesome. Now, I am not, please listen, everybody, listen very closely so you don't misunderstand Pastor right now. I am not minimizing that experience. That is a necessary part of salvation. I won't preach that right now. But those of you that know me know I'm very, very clear on that. We've got to be born of the Spirit. In fact, Paul said if you're not born of the Spirit, you're none of His. That's Bible. That's not Tim Gaddy. That's Bible. But if you think being filled with the Spirit is exciting, wait till you walk in the Spirit. You think this altar is a pretty cool experience? Wait till you're out in Walmart and you feel something in the Holy Ghost. Wait till God drops the name of someone in your spirit and you start praying for them. And you shoot them a text and say, I don't know why I felt to pray for you, but I've really been praying for you. And they shoot a text back to you and say, how'd you know about that? How'd you know I was walking through that tough time? How'd you know I was? And you can say, honestly, I didn't. But the spirit did. You talk about an exciting life, walking in the Spirit. Everybody say, knowing God, walking in the Spirit. Now, I would be remiss, and I'm coming to a close, but I would be remiss if I did not mention that walking in the Spirit and following Jesus always requires some things to be left behind. We cannot come to Jesus 
on our own terms. <laughs> That's such good preaching, Brother Gaddy. Just go right ahead and preach that. When Jesus came to Matthew in Matthew 9 and verse 9 at the tax table, he looked at Matthew and he said, follow me. What does the Bible say, Brother Darrell, happened? The Bible says that Matthew left the tax table and in the wake of the call from Jesus to follow him was a job not filled and an empty tax table. In Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus occasions upon Peter and Andrew who are fishing, they say to, he says to Peter and Andrew, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And the Bible says in Matthew 4 and 20, they left their nets and followed after Jesus. So in the path, in the wake of following Jesus, there will always be some things left behind. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 22, this is amazing to me, when Jesus comes upon James and John who are in a boat fishing with their father, he says the same things to them that he said to Peter and Andrew. He said, follow me, come after me. And watch what they did. The Bible says in the 22nd verse of Matthew 4 that James and John got out of the boat and left the boat behind and followed Jesus. Now on the surface, that seems kind of like leaving nets behind. Same industry, nets, boat. But please listen. That's not the only thing that James and John left behind. Because seated in that boat was their father. Seated in that boat was the man who had the fishing business, who was most likely giving the fishing business over to his boys. Can you see this with me? Can you imagine this in your mind? Jesus, a strange man walking up to two grown men in the boat and looking at them with a steely look in his eyes and simply saying two words, Follow me. James and John get up out of the boat and leave the boat there. But they didn't just leave the boat. They left their daddy sitting in the boat. They did more than walk away from nets and a boat. They most likely walked away from a career that was being handed to them. But may I say this today. There are some relationships that will not go with us when we follow Jesus. There are some relationships that have to be left behind in order for me to follow him. And that is why it is absolutely imperative that we walk in the Spirit. Absolutely imperative. I come to a close. In fact, the musicians can come. God's call to New Life Church this year is to know God, to walk in the Spirit. And then the last part of Mark chapter 8 and verse 34 gives us a hint at perhaps the most exciting part of the call, the most exciting part of following the Lord Jesus. When Jesus simply says in Mark 8 and 34 what I just mentioned that he mentioned to Simon and Andrew and James and John. He said, follow me. Follow me. Because there is not a call from the Lord that will not necessitate us pursuing his kingdom. His kingdom. On the surface, when I use the word kingdom, I used to get a little bit conflicted by that word because we don't have a governmental structure in our country that is a kingdom. When I think kingdom, I think of Saudi Arabia. I think of old England, kingdom. Inherent within the word kingdom, the root word of kingdom is king. And this is why in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, when Jesus is on a mountain preaching this great sermon on the mount, he says this, seek First, the kingdom 
of God. And all of these other things, what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, where you're going to end up, all these other things will be added to you. Why is it? Listen, honest question. Why is it that it is so easy sometimes to seek everything else? And then when we get in a fix, say, Hail Mary. Help me, Jesus. When actually, it's completely opposite. To be a follower of Jesus Christ, we are to seek first His kingdom. I mentioned that word king is embedded within the word kingdom. Kingdom literally means the domain of the king. Everything that has to do with the king. That's what I'm called by Jesus to seek after. Listen. I'm a firm believer that our greatest talents, our greatest talents should not be given to the secular world. But they ought to be invested in God's kingdom. Do I mean that we ought to give the world second best or no talent at all? No. Many of you have jobs that involve how you are wired, your gifting, your talent, and your ability. But do you know God's call to follow him means that I give the kingdom first bid in my life. I make sure that however God has gifted me, I'm giving that first to the kingdom. And then God has this unique way of letting all the details work out in his plan. Because I am interested first in the area of the king. I am interested first in the domain of the king. Praise God. And so in 2016, Lord, being our helper, we are going to pursue the kingdom of God. We're going to discover where I fit in the kingdom of God. How am I gifted? When I look at God's church, when I look at the local church, how could I see myself using my talents, my abilities to follow after Jesus. Now let me tell you how practically we're going to do this. Today is Sunday, January 17th. Ten days from now, we're going to have a small group in homes, in 12 different homes around Cabin. It's become a great, great way to connect, to grow, and to serve in the kingdom. And part of that small group that Wednesday night is going to be a discussion about pursuing the kingdom of God. And so I'm going to give you homework. Ready? Wow, we went to church and got homework. Here's the homework. Regardless of whether you think there's a place for this in the kingdom, what could you see yourself doing in the kingdom of God? Based on your talents and your abilities, what do you think you could add to the kingdom of God? And by the way, I'll just clue you in since you're going to be working on homework. The answer is not nothing. <laughs> We're going to instruct our small group facilitators. That is not an answer that we will accept. <laughs> Because that would be a slap in the face to the creator. He designed us and he ordered our steps so that we could invest ourselves pursuing in the kingdom of God. So I want you to stand with me right now. In just a moment, in just a moment, and I'm going to ask everyone just to stay in the sanctuary and if at all possible not be moving in and out. But in just a moment, I'm going to ask all, everyone that will to join us up here at the front. We're going to close this service in prayer. And we're going to be very specific about the prayer. We're not just going to have a general altar call. Those are good. But we're going to pray today, as many as will, that we consecrate ourselves to knowing God this year. 
that we consecrate ourselves and dedicate ourselves to walking in the Spirit, denying ourselves and walking after the Spirit of God. And then we dedicate ourselves to begin pursuing His kingdom, investing in His kingdom. Lord, I ask that you would do something significant in the hearts of men and women right now. I trust that you've spoken today. I do believe you've done that. And I give you all the praise for that. Just draw people to consecration right now. And I thank you in Jesus' name. If you're here and you're ready to consecrate in those areas, would you join me? I'm going to invite everybody in the house that will. Would you come?